You can go. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about the paradoxes of quantum mechanics. This is something I've been working on uh, half time for the past uh, decade or so. Um, this is uh, this is Albert Einstein here on the left, and this is Niels Bohr. Uh, they are two of the fathers of quantum mechanics, and uh, they had some famous arguments about uh, interpretation and meaning of quantum mechanics. Okay. Um, there are conceptual paradoxes in quantum mechanics that have existed since the birth of quantum mechanics. Uh, 2025 is actually the year of the quantum, uh, maybe because quantum mechanics was finalized uh, in, its, uh, in its initial form about 100 years ago. Um, 19, in in uh, 18, 1925. Um, it's, these paradoxes have never been solved. It's now 100 years and the same paradoxes are still with us. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a few of those, give some examples. OK, so this is Einstein again on the left, and this is Leonard Susskind on the right. So um, quantum mechanics gives rise to the worst prediction in the history of science, probably the worst prediction in, in history, period. Um, according to quantum mechanics, uh, the Einstein's cosmological constant uh, is off by 120 orders of magnitude. That's one with 120 zeros after it. So that's, a, that's the, an unheard of uh, discrepancy. Um, so quantum mechanics, definitely, there's something wrong, clearly wrong there, and no one's been able to figure it out since the beginning of quantum mechanics. Uh, if, if, uh, if this were true, um, the, uh, the universe would fit between us and the moon. That's how big of an error it is in terms of uh, human scale. All right, this is uh, Erwin Schrodinger and his famous cat. This is the most famous paradox. Uh, you've got a cat in a box, and uh, there's a radioactive uh, material here. And if, we're, if a nucleus decays, quantum mechanics says it goes into a superposition state of being decayed and not being decayed, a quantum superposition. Uh, the Geiger counter picks that up. In principle, according to quantum mechanics, the Geiger counter goes into a superposition of detecting and non-detecting. And then the Geiger counter uh, triggers this hammer to fall and releases poison gas, which kills the cat. But according to quantum mechanics, the cat is in a superposition, a quantum superposition of alive and dead at the same time. Um, that sounds ridiculous, and it is. That was, that was uh, Schrodinger's point that if you believe in quantum mechanics, you get ridiculous predictions, like uh, a cat that's half dead and half alive. Uh, OK, this is the Einstein's boxes paradox to Einstein. Uh, the idea is you have a particle uh, uh, in, a, uh, in a box here, and you let it go, and it, it moves um, towards a beam splitter. And then at the beam splitter, the beam splits in half. One part of the particle's probability goes one way, and the other goes the other way, until you wind up with the probability that the particle's in, in two different boxes, in two different places, disconnected from each other. Um, and then what happens is you go open one of the boxes, and the particle either appears in one of the boxes, shown here, or it doesn't appear in the box at all, shown there. So the, the, the paradox is, how does one part of the probability know instantaneously at a distance that the other box has been opened and the particle hasn't been seen? Uh, that's part of the uh, non-locality problem of quantum mechanics. OK, Benninger paradox. This is a. Uh, interaction-free measurement uh, uh, developed by Renninger. The idea is you release a particle from uh, uh, location S here, and the particle expands symmetrically. Oops, sorry. Nope. Uh, yeah, the particle expands symmetrically, and uh, it goes out to uh, uh, a, a semicircle E1, which is, which is basically lined with detectors. So it goes out there. And it could trigger a detector there, which would make a flash on the screen. Or it could keep, continue going till it reaches E2 and makes a flash on that screen. And so the, idea, the point here is that if you time it, if you release the particle and then time it so the particles have plenty of time to get to E1 but not yet to E2, 
um, you've effectively made a measurement that the particle is not going to show up um, on E1. It's not going to show up on E2 uh, behind, behind E1. It's going to show up somewhere else, somewhere, somewhere along the rest of the, rest of the circle. And so the point is you, you, you've made a measurement, you've localized the particle without any interaction with the par particle. This is called an interaction-free measurement. And it's, it's a, another paradox of quantum mechanics. Delayed choice paradox. Um, I won't explain details of this one. It gets a little bit complex, but I wrote a paper about it if you're interested. Uh, the point is that uh, this is, uh, these are mirrors here. M1 and M2 are mirrors, and B1 and B2 are beam splitters. When the beam hits B1 and B2, it splits into two parts. This is called a max sender interferometer. And the funny thing about this is if you go through the, uh, uh, the calculations of what happens when, the particle seems to know what will happen in the future. Uh, the particle seems to know, um, if you let the particle go so it's halfway through the max sender interferometer, and then you remove B2, uh, it will behave as if B2 was missing the whole time. So somehow the particle knows that B2 is going to be taken away even though you've pulled out at random. Similarly, if you put it in at random after the particle's left, it knows that you're going to put it in somehow. So that's, uh, that's uh, another example of non-locality or uh, things seeming to happen in, in a non-linear fashion in time. Okay, a more fundamental paradox underlying uh, some of these paradoxes are uh, wave functions are how we describe uh, a quantum object. A wave function is similar to a wave, like a water wave, except wave functions for more than one particle, they live in a higher dimensional space. So they don't live in the normal space we think about where we have x, y, z, and time, if we want to talk about uh, relativity. They live in a, a space that's got as many dimensions as there are particles. So, um, and it's hard to imagine how that space interacts with our space. No one knows how that happens. Because there's, uh, say, a thousand dimensions in a quantum computer, um, but, but the results we see are always in our, our three, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. So that's, uh, uh, that's another problem in quantum mechanics. Uh, what do other physicists say? Um, there's a lot of confusion about uh, what quantum mechanics means to this day. Uh, you won't hear about this in your freshman physics class because physicists don't like to talk about it. But um, there's really um, something missing in quantum mechanics. There's something that's not understood and is quite important and could significantly change things. Okay, one possible solution which I've been working on is that if you imagine, if you let particles travel both forwards and backwards in time, that actually answers most of the paradoxes that I've shown you. Not all of them, but most of them. And so that's what I've been spending the past five years on, is uh, trying to solve uh, paradox by paradox, use it with the assumption that particles can travel both forwards and backwards in time. Okay, here's some reading recommendations. Um, the first book has no equations, and it's, it's a great book for introducing you if you're an artist or uh, someone who doesn't like equations. Uh, the other books are, uh, the other book is Foundation of Quantum Mechanics is the best book on foundations and problems in the foundations. You can also look up my papers on Google Scholar, and um, there's, a, there's an extra part about why I work outside of academia that you'll have to click on when you get the slides. And, uh, that's it. Questions? Discussion?